Hello friends, welcome to my channel. Today I will discuss about building a WA serverless function using Rust. So I am building a side project on sketchnotes.co. Here you can draw some images, arrows and some different icons along with text and code snippets. So as part of this video tutorial, I am going to demonstrate how I am trying to build a REST based AWS Lambda APIs. That will be act as a, you know, all the API layers for my web application. So the front end is developed using React and hosted in AWS S3. And in the previous video, I talk about how I am using AWS Cognito and federated with the Google Gmail identity provider. So which allow me to use if a user do have the Google credential or Gmail account, they no need to register in my website again. So using that, they can able to sign in and I'll face their past name and other information from Gmail directly. And it would be make easier, you know, for user as well as, well as for me. So that setup I've done in the previous video, that is more theoretical. But assuming that uh, it is completely based upon OAuth 2. So assuming that process is completed, so the browser or the client will pass this request to the AWS Lambda services and which will be developed using Rust and that will integrate with uh, you know DynamoDB. So the, as part of that uh, all the APIs are secured and the client needs to pass this JWT token. And in this Lambda service what I am going to show today, I am going to decode that uh, JWT token and if it is a new request, I'll store into DynamoDB. If it is a get request, I'll fetch it the information from DynamoDB. One disclaimer I would like to put before I proceed to the next section, that as I'm building this new application, I'm learning the Rust as well. So I'm a bit new to Rust. So I may not follow all the best practices, and I do some incremental development as per my need. So there are some assumptions I'll make and I may not go very secure path in the MVP stage because the JWT token what I receive just to in the initial starting phase I'm just going to decode it. <clears throat> but I may not uh, do more secure way of uh, uh, retrieving the token and authenticate again against this uh, AWS Cognito that I may do in the future. Whenever I go to the stage, I'll discuss about that. So please keep in mind that as I'm developing, I'm trying to source my in progress application. So in future, I may change it. So that keep in mind. So let's get started. Uh, this I already created. Uh, my Lambda function in AWS console. This is sketchnotes.rust. The main motivation I'm having for myself to choose Rust is it's uh, very less memory uses. <clears throat> you can see that uh, it is like 128 MB, the, menu, the starting configuration I've chosen. But the memory uses by Rust is only 16 MB or 17 MB. And uh, for each request, it is taking 30 to 40 milliseconds. So the build duration also very less. So using the Rust, so we can be very faster as well as I can save some money. Because in the AWS Lambda uses, the billing happened as per this uh, millisecond utilization. So 36 milliseconds. So fast to 1 million requests for, you know, per month is free. And after that, it will get uh, billing as per this. And it is very minimal. But they will calculate with their, some of these rules to come to that number. And also, if you see this called start, that is one of the, uh, if you are building any application into AWS serverless or any serverless 
Google or Cloud, this cold start is important. For other programming languages like Python, Ruby, or Java, this cold start is very high. During this, because your AWS Lambda container is not running for all that duration 24 hours. So whenever it will receive a fast request, at that time it will uh, download your code, uh, code binaries, bootstrap that uh, virtualize uh, environments and to started uh, serving this request. And usually it is very high, but if you see in this, uh, for during this all the process for the Rust compiler, Rust code base, it is only taking 209 millisecond. I am quite impressed by this number. So for that reason I am using it. <clears throat> and this will be, uh, this is a very basic Rust application I'm building. I'll show the code and uh, explain you each every step. So, and also there is a new feature introduced like function URL, a layer to use AWS Lambda. So we need to use API Gateway. API Gateway has, has still its, has its own relevance. For example, you can do throttling and different kind of configuration. But recently AWS launched function URL. So using function URL, we can directly call this REST, uh, the, call this AWS Lambda function using, uh, using HTTPS URL, which is really nice. So we don't need to use API gateway for that. So creation of this Lambda function is very simple. You have to click uh, create function and uh, author from scratch and give this function name. I give in the sketch notes dash rush right. An important aspect is that here you choose this uh, provide your own bootstrap on Amazon Linux 2 provide your own bootstrap on Amazon Linux 2 because Rust directly is not supported by, you know, uh, AWS. And also I think in future also they will support or not, I still have doubt because uh, for example, Java or Node.js, they need a runtime because Rust is a compiled language and can directly run a, a, in the bare metal. So it has a directly executable. Once you, you know, compile and create a binary from the Rust, there is no need to have special runtime. So it can directly run in the Linux. But for Java, Java can't directly run that exe code in a, you know, Linux directly. So they need JRE or JVM to execute. Similarly in Node.js, JavaScript code can't run it directly in Linux or Windows. So probably, for that reason, it may not be very much required. So, you know, provide your own bootstrap. Uh, you choose this option. And uh, I heard uh, some art, uh, like AWS talking about like, if you use ARM64, so you will get uh, better performance and you will save some money. But I am not using that at this moment. But in future, I may move to ARM64, but the, for my example, I'm using x86-64. And you can enable this function in URL, that's what I'm talking about, so that you can directly call from Postman or from any other client. And this is uh, no other uh, configuration is needed. And one more important thing you have to do, the execution role. So uh, you can choose this default option, but once it created a execution role, you have to change and give permission to your DynamoDB table, where you are going to insert and, uh, you know, uh, retrieve that uh, element. So I'll show you DynamoDB, but you need some basic understanding. I believe that if you're planning to create a AWS Lambda function, you have some basic understanding about time roles and DynamoDB concepts. So if you are not sure, please drop me a comment. I'll create another video for the, that area also. But today my intention is to cover more on the Rust side. So once we create this function, 
then we'll go to this uh, rush part before i explain about the trash part <clears throat> this is the three endpoint i'm exposing one is get this is a lambda function url host name so once you click on the get nodes it will return an array so id takes the title so these are my blog post you can uh, So this would be the get uh, nodes, all the nodes with ID, text, title, it will be returned. And below we are returning this user like email and pa uh, name, so in case we want to display somewhere. And we have another, AP this API we are going to build in Rust, but I am showing how it will look like. So this is a post request and the same nodes URL. Here, uh, this ID. So, the ID I am debating myself to generate in the client or in the server side. But for the time being, I am generating in the client side. So, assuming the client will generate this ID and pass it to server. But maybe in future, I will change it. So, title, text, and data. This, this particular JSON is a pre flow JSON structure. The server side is not going to validate or inspect the data. This is where all the text information, the arrows, coordinates, all the my state of the sketchnotes application will be stored as a blob or a JSON string. So I can create like, uh, let's say, let me change like ID. Once I do the post. So the note created, one JSON message written in. And this is status code is 201 created. So in the rest, I'll show you how we can set this uh, status code, and how this created will be auto inferred. And once we have this, uh, we can do get nodes slash. So nodes and nodes ID, if you do that, so you'll get the result like title, users, and tags, and data. And one important thing is that all the API, you have to pass this BRA token, or you can, if you see this authorization, authorization header, BRA, and the JWT token. This ID token you have to pass, if you don't pass, if you pass wrongly, so it will throw some error. 401 unauthorized, and with some message, invalid JWT token. So this JWT token you will get from AWS Cognito. It is a separate process, not specific to AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda will validate this JWT token. I'll show you some code how to do that. And once it is a valid JWT token, then only it will provide this access. And this email, so you will be able to access this uh, as per this email. This is like primary key for us. Okay. Now, I'm not going to very basic step of uh, how to bootstrap a Rust-based project. I created several tutorials for that. So it is a simple cargo new project you can create. And uh, uh, specific to AWS Lambda. So you have to install a full cross-compiler toolchain, Mosul. Okay, and you have to link this uh, this step, this Linux Mosul GCC to this bin Mosul GCC. So this particular compiler tool chain will allow us to compile our cargo project or the Rush project to this target runtime. You know the x86 64 that uh, Amazon Linux. So this is the only one important step you have to do that and after that in the dot cargo file we have to specify this linker as you know uh, this muscle gcc 
So this is the so you can do this uh, again and again. But if you use this config file, the linker will be associated with this Mosul GCC. That will make the life easier going forward. Then you can uh, do that uh, most of this uh, building it very straightforward. So I have created one uh, simple cell script to compile this uh, project and create this zip file. If you can see this sketchnotes.trust zip file, right? And upload into the AWS Lambda account. If I show you that cell script, and uh, this particular, I have to install this open SSL as well. This is required if you want to decode this JWT token. I have used one library. I'll explain about that. For that uh, uh, JWT library or the create, we need to provide this open SSL path here as well. Otherwise, for this uh, Lambda deployment, if you are not uh, depend upon JWT token, you don't want to do, you don't need to do this step. And this is the compiling stage. Uh, cargo build release, because by default, cargo build, if you run, it will be creating package in a debug mode. And the binary size is very huge. If you do release, so it is much more faster. And it is much compression. And the target is this cross compiler Mosul 1 x8664. So, there we, our zip uh, binary will be created. And this will be created in this place dot target directory. This is this runtime, a release, and bootstrap. This bootstrap, how it will be known in the cargo.toml file. I given this uh, you know name as a bootstrap because uh, this is a requirement for AWS Lambda. So your binary must be known as name as a bootstrap. <clears throat> you can give any name, but for AWS Lambda, you want to zip it right. So we need to give as a bootstrap. I'll come to this cargo tomorrow again. And this uh, I commented few things. Uh, I, I am trying out with compressing this zip file, but I, it is not needed anymore. But then you have to do zip. This bootstrap file, whatever the binary is uh, generated, you have to zip inside this sketchnotes.rush. And uh, I've used hyphen J option to ignore that uh, full path. Only it will just do not show the directory name and some kind of setup stuff. And this is the AWS Lambda command. So this is the AWS Lambda command, update function code, the function name, region and the zip file name. So this is a simple cell script. If you run it, it will compile it, create a zip again and upload into Lambda. And this cargo toml, this package is a basic information. I am using this 2021 latest edition, which is recently launched and I didn't face any problem with that so far. And this is the entry point, like source.main.rs, where we'll write our most of the code. And this I'll explain some uh, later. The main idea about this particular thing, the various option is that by default, uh, whenever I created uh, this cargo build release, the zip file become like 6 MB or something, 6 megabyte. So once I use these various options, the you know size come down drastically. So if you see here, the size is 1.8 MB. So from 6 MB to it came down to 18.0 MB. So definitely it is going to help into the cold start because it no need to download that 6 MB file, but it has to download 18.0 MB file. This is one of the big complaint if you're using Rust because Rust, you know, how to minimize this uh, package size. Because if you are writing JavaScript code, something that size is file size would be much more smaller. You can reduce, but you have to install the runtime again for that. But here, this is uh, about the binary. We don't need to have separate runtime. 
and with this 1.8 MB also the there is not significant penalty because AWS Lambda is able to fetch this file very quickly. Whenever you upload this particular zip file, will be going to upload into S3 bucket, and during this cold start or the initialization, AWS will be fetching this 1.8 MB file from this S3 bucket and will initialize the code very fast. So the, and the, this is the dependency section. We have to use one uh, Lambda HTTP library or create. This is the Lambda runtime for Rust created by AWS Labs only. So in the GitHub project, you can see some more information. I'll give you the link in the description below. And this uh, set is one very popular library. If you're working with JSON or any API, so they will provide the serialization or deserialization capabilities. Whenever you send the request to the Rust, so Rust follows some different types. So the JSON to Rust type and Rust to JSON type. That conversion, this SETD is very comfortably providing the capability. We're going to use the SETD very heavily on this project. And there are a few dependencies related to AWS types, config, and DynamoDB because we are going to integrate with the DynamoDB. And we need a async runtime because all the code we are going to write for AWS Lambda is async, not sync. So we need a, a by default, Rush doesn't come with the async runtime. Like in Node.js, you don't need to download separate runtime for that. But this is not exactly have any impact into the, uh, not like JDK or JRE runtime or the uh, Node.js runtime. This is like uh, no runtime impact. It will help pull in the compile time only and it will uh, provide the support for that, uh, uh, support for that to execute this AWS uh, async code. So we need Tokyo. Tokyo is quite popular, but you don't need to know much information about that. I'll explain whenever it is relevant. And J, JWKS client, it is a different functionality, but I'll try to use a simple functionality for it for, for decoding that uh, JWT token. So I'm not going to do super secure way of authentication. I will get the JWT token. JWT token is usually base 64 encoded. So I'll just decode that information and uh, make sure that uh, whatever the information I'm looking for is present email and given name or not. And once it's done that, I can say the token is all good. If I'm having some difficulty into getting those token, I'll throw some errors. Now let's uh, discuss about some code. So in the source directory, you will write the code. Initially it started with main.rs, but slowly I split it into multiple files. So you can also start your initial program from one file, then you branch out. And I'm also refactoring code as a go. So don't take this uh, code style and as, as part of the best practices because I'm learning in the Rust and also I'm uh, taking some easy way to approach the Rust instead of uh, using all the performance tuning and all the best practices from the Rust development practices. I'm not following that. Let's get started. This main.rs file is the entry point. And initial section, we have some imports. And this, uh, this mod and this is a file name, what are the internal files I've created in the left hand side. So I'm importing all modules and this libraries. But the important section is this one. So if you notice a couple of things here, this is not a normal function, function.main. It started with async. So AWS Lambda runtime provided by that Lambda HTTP is using that async Rust concepts. 
So we must have to use async keyword just for our the entry point of main function. And this async capabilities is not provided out of box by Rust standard library. For that we need to use a third party runtime. In this case it is recommended and the Tokyo is being used. So this is a macro or directive is being used in this uh, you know before the function Tokyo main. So Tokyo will handle this how to provide this runtime capabilities first. But if that is goes out of the way so this uh, Tokyo is provide this capability over async and await. These are the keywords are standard. In future if they or you want to change from Rokyo to some other runtime library you can feel free to do that. But I have not tested whether it will work with this AWS Lambda runtime or not. Most probably not because that uh, there are few wrapper libraries is provided by that uh, AWS Labs as part of AWS Lambda runtime. <clears throat> so assuming that you are using Tokyo so you use this uh, directive or macro syntax and async and here await keyword you know and the return type is a result this is a standard result uh, because there is no exception in the rust right so this main will return result but it will return void this empty parenthesis signal that this uh, main function no need to return anything in case of successful in case of failure it can propagate this error but in case of there is some error happen most probably if you don't customize our http code and message so it will throw like http code as 5000 or sorry 500 and internal server error so any error happen below the down the line so that will be uh, shown as a 500 error or internal server error this is a lambda initiation function and this is a return statement I am not using any semicolon at the end or no return keyword but if you see this okay is a void of empty parenthesis this is to signal that we are returning nothing So the entry point is this lambda run, this is a run function and here you have to give a service uh, dot function. This service function is also is from different library. In order to import that create or library, it is from tower. Tower provides some kind of low level service to service communication. Uh, so it leverages that uh, service function. And here you have to write your own function <coughs> router. This is where you are going to write your lambda specific crash code. And because this run particular function is a async one, so you have to await to wait for that response. And if there is a this question mark transfer, if there is an exception, it will propagate that error to that caller function, in this case main. This uh, await uh, is actually, let me explain about this async concept a little bit. I'll create a dedicated tutorial to explain about async concept in the Tokyo runtime, but just to give a brief idea of what's going under the hood. Whenever we click a await right, so once we get a request here, so this can directly access to any file or IO or DynamoDB, any system. So, but the thread one is not going to wait for request one to complete it. This, this, it will request one will trigger a, you know, call to DynamoDB. So that can happen in a few milliseconds or it may take like five minutes or 10 minutes. But at that time, the thread one is not going to block for the request one. For blocking IO or in example of Java or Python or Ruby, so if you are not using async model, so the thread one will wait for request to one to complete. It go to the IO system or network IO to get this response and pass it across. So it can't serve request two. But in case of async mode, 
head one once it get a request it will send this request to this uh, underlining io system and it keep on polling this polling you no need to do as a application developer that's why this tokyo is coming into the picture then they have a concept known as executor <clears throat> so that will take care about when to poll and when to keep track of the of that polling information so whenever the request is ready it will inform the third one so that you know the request one can also complete and send the response back so when this request one the, when the response is not coming to the picture the thread one is feel free to process or serve this request for request two so request to also receive it does some kind of transformation and send a request for the underlying io system and uh, then thread one can respond to either request one or respond to whichever is coming the response quicker so that is in a nutshell in the async fundamentals but maybe i'll create a dedicated video to explain more detail about that so that's why this await so await is not uh, actually this thread is not going to wait for this particular thing <clears throat> but uh, it at the same time this uh, lambda can process another request till it is processing this one so this is the router function this is also async function here uh, we can pass the signature is looks like this it takes request as an input argument and return is a result type so if it is successful it passes some subtype of into response if it is failed you return a error type this into response is a trait Uh, trait is a kind of interface or kind of uh, you know abstraction layer is talks about like what are the functionality that uh, your concrete object will have so this this makes very easy to integrate with that uh, you know set day because set day we can pass like set day object i'll show you in a second but the set day of the json object we can create and we can return as a response <clears throat> so this into response is a part of a lambda http you know uh, this uh, runtime over provided by aws labs and here if you want to return the sender json value so then it will be compatible with that imp into response and we can get in the browser you know the example i have shown you right this structure this is json structure we can directly return from here and if you see here this is the value i'm talking about so we can create like this kind of json structure and we can simply return it this would be compatible and the, uh, <clears throat> coming below so here we have initialized our variable with using json macro this json macro is part of sadd json and uh, you working with uh, sadd json is very comfortable because if you know about json inside this macro you can just use the json as it is with uh, string double quote with this key and value and you can uh, if you have some variable you can directly give this variable names so your json will be created immediately i'm using this mutable version because later point of time depending upon the method whether it is gate post or some path i'm trying to you know i'm trying to call this so if you're trying to write your first program if you know about this set uh, json and able to construct this json you know value object <clears throat> you can successfully able to write you know your first program so this as i said this uh, impl response we can pass value 
So instead of passing this response object, if you directly pass this response here, that will also still work. So it will return this uh, this an object. But because if you want to customize the status code, because ideally we don't want to return two zero zero okay right. If there is any error, we want to return different error codes or status code. For example, currently we are supporting get method and post method. Because if you see our APIs, we are uh, for creating or updating we are using post. For getting all the nodes we are using get. And getting individual nodes we are using get nodes with ID. So we are supporting only post and get. If they are trying to pass like post, put, there are so many different things, we are not supporting those. <clears throat> so for that, right, we are going to return this message method not allowed. And we are, uh, this is 405 status code we have to return. So to return the status code exactly, we have to do some, write some more coding here. So this is the response uh, struct available as part of HTTP library. So we are using this uh, HTTP response builder. Builder is a very good common pattern, design pattern in Java <coughs> or JavaScript in different uh, programming language, you can have this builder pattern. This is just to create a response body type, but slowly like uh, if you need status, you can pass a predefined status. If you don't need it, it will assume some default values. <coughs> So status code has one struct, which is uh, having all the mapping for that to order the status code available. If you want to see that. It must be see. These all kind of status code maps are there. 100 means continue. So we don't need to define it. So it already we it have all these mappings or tuple it, it dictionary it have that so once we pass this number so whichever the number you want so it will create this status object and uh, by itself it will uh, it will derive that message so as i said if you want to return only this response which is of a set day json value that is also compatible you could have directly written the response. But because you want to modify this HTTP status code, you need to do this response builder and pass the status. And the status code is already a good dictionary available. It already have all the codes available. And it can derive this message because we have to hard code the message, right? So we have to just from UCT session, we pass this status code. So we are passing 405, so it is all good. And in the body, we construct this body from response to string. This response is a value type. So we have to get this string type out of it. And once we get a string representation, we can pass to body from. Because HTTP body is the end of the day is a simple string. It doesn't worry about like it is a JSON or whatever maybe. It is a simple string. Okay. Just to demonstrate this, if you, let's say we are using some kind of put function, so which is not supported. See method not allowed because here we given method not allowed message. This is written. And if you see, you see the 405. Here we are given 405. And this method not allowed. We have no, this is not same as this one. <clears throat> this come from the status code and the dictionary. So method not allowed automatically populated, right? And in this case, this uh, JWT token, we are not doing any checking. So even though you pass it or not pass it, it doesn't uh, bother too much. Delete method not allowed. Okay. But once you are making, uh, you know, I think this is a get call. So we are going to build like get call or post call. So all the logic we have here, like uh, we are doing some checks. So 
so if the uh, this request has so many interesting function so we can st slowly start it using one by one so the request dot it is body it is headers you know it is methods so you can have the and other things is not relevant method body path parameters so we are going to use path parameters just to extract that uh, nodes id i think this path parameter i'm having some issues so i'm using another one that is row http path because i'm not getting this path parameter the way i wanted it and we have a payload here from the request in case you want to fetch it query parameter so uri <clears throat> so it is some important interesting function you can debug it put some debug statement and you can explore what other information is coming as part of this request payload so you can get a use of it okay And once we take this method is get or post, we want to make sure that uh, they're passing a JWT token. So this is what this is authenticated method will do. This method is I written. I'll show you what is the logic for that. But in this particular is authenticated method, I'm only checking this JWT token passed or not. It's a BRA token in the authorization header. I'm not cross verifying with uh, AWS Cognito or Google. I, there is no need to directly go with the Google. But in future, if you want to make it more secure, I may be going to pass this AWS token. Let's see this uh, is authenticated function. We are passing this request. But we are just passing the reference because we are not going to pass this ownership to this function and or we are not planning to do some mutable or make some changes in the request body and uh, here i am returning a result this is like custom defender data structure like i am uh, this is authenticated once it is <coughs> So this I have decided, this particular is authenticated method will return some map, map will have a key value, is the email and that value is that actually email and then a uh, given name and some value. So this, this particular information will be retrieved from this request at the request header, author, I think authentication or authorization. Authorization header. From this BRA token, this two information will be retrieved and can be passed as a result. If those two are present, if you are unable to, and this particular method will call this to decode this JWT token. If it is not possible, it will throw an error. And this error particular object is, if you see this error, it is like lambda runtime error. And this error, I have created my custom error. If you see here, error.rs, I am using the same name. I am just thinking to use a different name or same name, but uh, I decided to use the same name only. So wherever I able to catch this custom error, I am passing two messages. One is code, one is message. This code, I am trying to make it same as HTTP code. So, I, so that I can change this response based upon this code. If it is server error 500 plus, if it is a data issue from this client, so I can send it 400 plus and so on. And message is some relevant description, which can make some sense if you read this error. And I've not uh, this, this, this display trait is 
just to print some information and this error implementation is to initialize a error instance and there are few to get us this bit simple one and i have a, i have having two macro derive and parcel equal parcel equal may be helpful in doing this uh, whenever we want to write some test right so we can compare between two error object so comparing in the two error object so this parcel equal derive will be helpful so this will compare this code message i don't need to write my code to compare it you know so i can compare between two error object so few places i'm using if let if let is a alternative syntax to match pattern sometimes this feels a little bit uh, convenient to use you can definitely use match pattern if you feel more comfortable with that but this idea what is trying to do right request dot headers dot get authorization authorization is a key so this get method usually will return an option if this uh, authorization header is present then it will return a option with some data if this authorization header for some reason it is not passed then it will return none if it is none then this else block will be executed here i created a this error object my custom error with 401 authorization header not provided this i am returning it But if authorization key is present, then I am using if let some header. And if you notice here, it is like header reference of header value. So the header value is stored into a header. Okay. And this step I feel like it is a redundant, but anyway, I have to do that. And we can't directly access this uh, string value of the bearer token. So we have to do this header dot to string, and it also return a result. And so if you return a result, we have to use OK and else block. If it is returning option, we have to use sum and non block. So there are a bit of inconsistent, but it may fail. That is probably the reason. Once you try to convert to string, it may not return none. It may be some failure. Probably that is the reason. But anyway, in the else block, I am providing the same message. I don't like this uh, this particular header to, to string. Why that is even required? But because it is there, so we have to handle that case. And this is a bit of logic because bearer and uh, <clears throat> the JWT token we have to separate. So header we have to split it into a empty space because bearer and this token separated by a space, right? So once we separate by space, so we'll get the bearer and this token separately. And we can collect using a vector. So this header would be a vector. So if that bearer token is passed correctly, ideally we should get two value. Our length should be two, right? First one should be the, the zero index should be the bearer token. And the second one should be the index token. The length is not two, whether it may be more or less, it is not a valid bearer token. So bearer token is not provided. <clears throat> see if you see here, the status code is same. 401 unauthorized but we can change this message to be more explicit or to make more close to the error exactly wherever we are having it and this is the important piece once we get this uh, bearer token we can uh, decode this information and we can pass this header one 
to string this is the table token we are passing and decode string and we are returning is as it is i'm not sure why we are not passing okay here that is one directly the value how it can work the hash map that is one question i can answer later but this is there is no semicolon here so this must be the written thing <coughs> so i am not wrapping with the okay but it is written in this result array let's let me see this uh, as maybe yeah so this is the function available inside uh, jwt token So this particular function decode the JWT token. And return that email and uh, some other information, for example, given name. Because these two attribute I have uh, attribute I made from this Google identity provider to the JWT Cognito. So my token is uh, definitely my id token or jw token does contain so i'm not going to do some signature validation or expiry validation so this is not very secure it's just kind of decoding this uh, id token so here i'm using this library right i have shown you earlier like in the cargo.toml file this JWS case token. This is helping me to decode this. Uh, I've tried with various uh, other library, but I've got mixed uh, result due to other thing. Then I finally found this particular uh, library or crate, which is working good. So I got the key store. This particular steps you can get from that uh, crate documentation page. Nothing fancy here. So once you get keystore, we decode it, we pass this token. And now most of the places I'm using the string type, you know, I'm allocating memory, even though this is not optimal for performance, but this token and other thing are very small. So I'm not trying to pass the reference and I'm not dealing with the lifetime. And uh, in future also, I may not uh, change too much on this part because this uh, the data size is not very significant. It is not going to affect much in the memory. But definitely the wherever I'm trying to pass this payload or the size of the data is very huge. At that time, I'll definitely consider to use the reference to optimally do the memory usage. But let's see in future how we can optimize. So keystore decode. So it needs like a string literal with a ampersand star. So I converted the string to HTR and decode it. So it, it will definitely return a result. So if it is a successful, it will return a JWT token of JWT type. Or else if it is failed, so we can uh, write our own customized error like 401 invalid JWT token. This error we can pass it. <laughs> and once it is successful, from JWT, we can get the payload. This payload will contain all this uh, JWT token payload. Let me show you that how the payload looks like. I have talked about this uh, JWT token and OAuth2 a little bit more on the previous video. But this JWT.io website is very good. Once you copy paste your JWT token, so it has uh, basically three part one is header and payload and uh, some signature information and this payload this given name and email is uh, the two attribute we are currently interested in <clears throat> so if you see that so jwt payload I am doing get string email. Similarly, get string given name. So this get string will return a option. It can be 
success or fail if the email is not present it will uh, you know return false so if it is uh, this email is not present i am throwing an error because for my processing about saving the data or getting the data this email is a required because it's the primary key for me so okay or or i'm using so i am propagating this creating an error 403 and email not present in the jw token so if you pass a correct id token this should be always available uh, but if you are using like access token this information may not be present so once i get like email and given name so i created a map so this in future i may change to a well-defined structure but for the time being because it's this this utility JW token doesn't need to worry about like application structure it can flexible enough to store any kind of uh, key value pair so email and email value and give a name and store i storing it out so this is the user profile if it's successful i'm returning okay in the user profile sorry <clears throat> so this result has map would be written in case of some error i am returning uh, different values messages with different codes and one good benefit i see to use so wherever this function is using because it's lambda sometimes the testing would be a bit painful because you have to deploy the code again and again and test it out each and every functionality so to bypass that effort what i did i tried to start writing this test inside this function itself i'm not in other programming language i don't do test driven development i appreciate the effort of testing but sometimes i got lazy into writing the test because i can test manually and get the result and able to proceed but here i started writing test cases because this is not a async function so like this is the uh, we have to write like config test more test decode test and this is two constant file i'm using if you see that here I have stored the ID token and access token. So wherever uh, in different uh, test should I'm using it, I'm uh, referring that as a constant file. So this is my test case. And I'm calling this uh, decode JWT function, passing this ID token. So it will return the result and I'm doing a couple of unwrap. Just quickly want to get this email and given name. So email given name, once I get it, I compare with this correct data. So if there is some problem or some issues will happen, then it will fail. I can debug it and fix this code. So the ID token is valid or not, email is present or not, because if I pass access token, the general token will be valid, but it won't contain this email. So invalid ID token, if you pass something, uh, just a string, ABCD, XYZ, something, so it will return this invalid JW token. So once we, it is easy to test it out. Cargo, I can do cargo test. It will run the data suit. So for writing the code even, so if you do cargo test and the test module name, so it executed three tests and written the result. If you do some mistakes here and if you don't compare it properly, is expected right if you let's say make some mistake then it will uh, say that uh, it will fail so if you see that this particular test case is failed and why it is failed and what is the difference if these two are not matching this is a simple primitive example but this can be very helpful into developing your application code 
and changing the uh, style. So basically, this decode function in inner cell will decode the code. If it is uh, not valid, it will return this error. But if it is valid and email and given and present, so it will wrap it in the hash map and return it in the result. This error is uh, my type. It contains the code and the message so that I can display this message proper appropriately wherever needed. And I'm using lots of uh, question mark. It will propagate this error. You know, whatever the error it receive. And uh, I'll handle it later. So in the main function to test also, I have written lots of test cases. So this is where the decode is coming into the picture. So what are the result I'm getting? I'm returning it on this line. But I'm just a bit confused like why OK is not used, but that is for separate data to debug. And here also I've written test case. So this OE, once we do is authenticated, decoding the digital token. So we'll do some get call and post call. And if there is error, we'll return some error message. Maybe in the next video, I'll explain about this get call, post call. And there we'll talk about DynamoDB and how we can do get and post. And what are the issues and uh, some experience I'm facing. So I'll try to explain it in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.